I hope you can say, I sure am glad I'm worshiping God today. I hope you can say, I'm sure glad I'm with God's people today. And I trust that as we've worshiped, that you have been blessed. And to look forward as we open up the Word of God and think about our great God that we serve. And uh, just fall more and more in love with Him. Those of you who are our guests today in this assembly, really thrilled to have you. And uh, hope that you are blessed. Hope that you'll come back. And uh, we're seeking to find the will of God and to live it in our lives and encourage others to do the same. We'd like to have you to be a part of that goal in life. And I uh, hope you'll be with us. For those of you who are with us on live stream, thank you for being a part of our assembly today. And uh, what a thrill it is to be able to worship God. And uh, sometimes people are sick. Sometimes people are unable to be in a worship service and participate in live streaming. And it's interesting how many folks talk about what a blessing that is to them. And we're thrilled that you're with us today. I want to ask you, and Steve's going to give some information about this later. I just want to ask you to remember the Duggar family down in Old Hickory, Tennessee, in your prayers. Um, uh, Dan Duggar and his family have been here. They were here last Sunday sitting over in this area here. Uh, Dan and his wife are the uh, caretakers down at WKYC. And uh, his dad, who's an, an elder at the Old Hickory congregation, uh, was out in the yard on Friday working in his garden, and the family found him. He'd had a heart attack, I guess, and died in the yard. And just encourage you to remember that family. Steve will give you some details in, in a little later, but uh, um, certainly ask you to remember that family. Today I want to talk with you about the incredible wisdom of God. And I want to look at God's wisdom in a number of ways. God is so perfect. He is so holy. He is so wise. David just read us in that wonderful scripture in Romans 11 and verse 33 about the depth of the riches of God's wisdom. Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9 said, As the heavens are higher than the earth, in saying God's words, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God says, I want to tell you something. I am so awesome. I am so above where you are. Don't ever forget how great I am. In the statement that Dave, Dave read us in Job 12 and verse 13, down further in that same chapter, Job said, with him are strength and prudence, the deceived and the deceiver are his. He talks about the amazing greatness of God. And yet, in so many ways that you and I look around in life, we see that evidence and ought to be impressed. I wonder sometimes if we touch the proverbial hem of the garment in the greatness of God and his wisdom. I want today to share with you some things that we look at in life, that we look at in the church, and ask you to walk away today in awe of our God. And I want to begin by seeing God's wisdom vividly and secretly seen in creation. The creation vividly shows God's wisdom. You have verse after verse in the Bible that calls our attention to stop and to think and to see the greatness of our God and his wisdom. Psalm 104, verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you've made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. God, let me stop and look around. Look at the picture. Just stop and think. And that's just trying to get your mind focused that way. Psalm 147, and verse 5. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Proverbs chapter 3, 19 and 20. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 12. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When I'm talking with people about just looking around and seeing the evidence that there's a God that exists. 
I'm reminded of Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, the universe, shows his handiwork. Jim talked about that a few moments ago. I thought he was going to steal my sermon. David talks about the universe and the wisdom of God that's seen in it if man just stops and thinks. I, I'm so amazed when, when I talk with people who affirm that they're atheistic or agnostic. When people claim that they believe that this universe, this earth just happened by a great explosion or by chance. And we stop and reflect upon what David said, look at the heavens and the firmament. And I think this morning about the sun, 93 million miles away from this earth, in the exact spot for life to exist. Hmm. If it were 43 million miles away, you'd be warm today. You'd be so warm, this earth wouldn't exist. If it were 143 million miles away, life couldn't exist here. We'd be a ball of ice. Hmm. The perfect place for life in all of its amazing intricacy to exist perfectly. I think about the moon. A lot of us just look up, talk about the moon at night. The moon, 238,857 miles from the earth in the exact place to clean the shores, to cause the waves of the ocean, and yet not to inundate the earth. Happened by chance? It's interesting in Lystra that Paul taught the idolaters about the true God. And he said, I want to tell you about the God that really exists. He's not a statue. He's not something man made up in his mind. Let me tell you about the true God. And he said to those idolaters, nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Paul says to these idolaters, stop and think about what you've seen all your life, the rain cycle. I'll not go into all the detail, but think about the rain cycle and how it occurs and what it says about a designer behind all of it. Think about the seasons in their consistency year after year. And they enable life to exist and thrive. You think about our human bodies. There's some of you in this room who work in the medical field. There are a number of you who've done studies in things about our world. I think if there's one thing, I, I'd l love to talk to some of you young people and encourage you some things. I, I would love to see some young people who are Christians, who have a Christian background and have an interest in... A problem with my mic here, guys, some reason, I don't know. I'd like to see some of our young people study some things about this universe and study things about our earth and our bodies And learn about the intricacies that man doesn't even understand today, doesn't even see. Now, in the lifetime of a lot of us in this room, hasn't it been incredible what we've learned? Now, you think about uh, some of you in your 80s and 90s, and two generations ago, people didn't live, for the most part, as long as people are today. And why is it? Because of what we've learned and, and the help that's there. It's amazing. I long for people who get even further in understanding things who can stand up and say, look at the intricacy that's here. Look at the design and the order that's here. And yet, with what you and I can see and what we can comprehend, I have to tell you, I, I've been able to learn some things in life about some things. But I must tell you, the more I learn, the more inadequate I feel. And I think as we learn things about our bodies, about this earth, about this universe, I think the more we learn, it's so inadequate and so unaware that we feel. We have some knowledge about the magnificence and the intricacies of the creation, but we've only touched the hem of the garment of all the wisdom of God 
that's microscopic, that's unseeable, that's imperceptible with the human mind, and that's undetectable with our eyes. When I look at the magnificence and the intricacy of creation, I feel so much like Job. Would you open your Bibles with me to Job chapter 38? You know in that great book of Job, Job was struggling about why all the bad things happened to him. He got no answers. He didn't understand at all what happened in chapters 1 and 2. But when Job challenged God and said, in essence, God, let's have a trial. And I want to defend myself. God, I have not been sinning. And everybody's telling me all this bad stuff's happened because I've sinned in my life. I haven't. God, I'd like to defend myself. God put him in his place and challenged him with these statements. Job 35, 38, excuse me, verses 1 through 5. Listen what God said. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? You understand what that question means? You don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. All right, you think you got some answers? Just suck it up and let me ask you some questions and you see what you know. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? All right, Job, you think you have the answers? Just answer those questions. Same chapter, verse 18. Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me, if you know all this. Chapter 40. I want to jump over to verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the Lord answered Job, and he said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. You're going to rebuke me? All right. You tell me the answers about things. He goes further. It's interesting in this text, uh, in verses 4 and 5. And look how Job, in his pitiful and humble response what Job says as God is challenging him. Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I've spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. God, I'm ashamed I've been challenging you. <laughs> God's not done with him. God continues questioning Job. And his challenge in chapter 40, verses 5 and 6 is this. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I'll question you, and you will answer me. Just answer me, Job. And then here's the questions. In chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, he says, Explain the behemoth. If you think you understand everything about creation, you explain the behemoth. All right, what in the world is that? Well, people got all kinds of ideas. Very well may be the dinosaur. If you understand all these things about the world, Job, just explain it. And then further, in chapter 41, the whole chapter, he says, if you understand everything, explain the Leviathan. I love reading some of the commentaries that guess on these things. It sounds like a dragon. You just explain all this, Job, in the creation if you think you got all the answers. Would you look at chapter 42, verse 6? Because when God deals with Job, he is brought to his knees in humility. He says in verse 6, Therefore I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. In the word of the hymn that we sometimes sing, farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand it all by and by. I don't think we have a clue in this life. 
to the incredible wisdom of God that's seen in this creation. I don't think we have a clue at the incredible wisdom of God that is indelibly stamped in everything in creation. And I don't think we ever will in this life until we get in eternity and the Godhead explain it to us if they choose to. But you know what, folks? The hymn, Our God, There Is a God, He's Alive, that we just sang, emphasizes God's incredible wisdom and knowledge and power in the creation of this universe. May I encourage you the rest of your life, however long that is or however short it is, to stop and see God's wisdom all around you and be amazed. Secondly today, I'm amazed at God's wisdom and some of the things we take for granted, some of the things the Bible teaches, and we just take it for granted because that's what the Bible says. You know, Jesus commanded sinners to be baptized in order to be saved with the blood of Christ. His commission to the apostles in Mark 16, 16 to go preach the gospel, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. The apostles taught that same truth. Peter and the apostles on the day of Pentecost taught, told those people who had shouted, crucify him, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Paul taught it time after time to the Romans. Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? There's where we got the blood. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Paul taught the jailer at Philippi about Christ and about baptism. Paul taught the Corinthians, and they were baptized in Acts 18, verses 1 to 8. He baptized the 12 men at Ephesus in Acts 19. Uh, that's what, by the way, Ananias had previously taught at that point, Saul of Tarsus, who later was the Apostle Paul, that's what he taught him. And after having been blinded and chastised by Jesus, why in the world are you opposing me and what my mission is? Saul was sent into the city of Damascus, and there he was told, you'll be told what to do there. Ananias came and told this penitent believer, why are you waiting Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But here's the question. We all know what the Bible teaches about this. But the question is, why did God choose baptism as the means and the place and time where sinners contact the saving blood of Christ? Why did God choose that? I don't think it's just happenstance. Number one, he chose something that was so easy for sinners to do. I've heard people who oppose baptism for salvation. Well, what if somebody's on the moon and they don't have any water? Well, you're not going to be there very long. You're going to be dead. You know, God chose the element that covers 67% of this earth in which we live. Two-thirds of it covered by water. Man can't live without it. And God chose that element to make it so easy for sinners who long to be forgiven of their sins, to be immersed, to be saved by the blood of Christ. But secondly, stop and think about the symbolism. Why did God, why did Christ choose immersion in water? The Messiah and Savior Jesus was murdered on the, on the cross. He was buried. He arose as the Lord and Savior. And sinners are called to die to sin by the blood of Christ and to arise to walk in newness of life, as we read in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And the picture, the symbolism of it, when we choose to leave sin, as a sinner is immersed in that water, the symbolism is, I'm making a conscious decision to be separated from sin. This is going to happen as I'm baptized. The blood of Jesus is going to wash away my sins, and I'm going to arise as the eunuch did in Acts 8, he went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because he'd found newness of life spiritually. The wisdom of God in choosing baptism. Thirdly, the wisdom of God seen in the church. I asked Rodney to lead us in that old, familiar, beloved song, God's Family. 
Brethren, we see the wisdom of God in the church by being family. Christians become family with other Christians. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Having been baptized, we continue to live in faith. Galatians 3.26, you're all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Continuing to walk in faith, you're continuing to be faithful children of God. Who we are in the church. And in the church, we're part of a family that's been born again. Sometimes we laugh together. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes we agonize for the struggles of another. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen, the church. What love. What support. What encouragement. Sadly, some, not most, who become Christians are ridiculed by their physical families. Some are even alienated by their physical families in the book of Hebrews. Those brethren were, were being alienated by their families. But you know what? When that occurs, we have a spiritual family who put their arms of love around us. They help us to be loved and encouraged. God knew what he was doing when he established the church. Family of the saved. Secondly, when I think about the church, I think about church organization. Christ, the head of the church, and the only head, he's the head of the body of the church, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He deserves all the glory. He deserves all the praise. He has all the authority, Matthew 28 and verse 18. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The wisdom of God that's seen in Christ being the head and the only head of the church in heaven and on earth. There's nobody else going to direct the church in any way except what Christ has taught because he's the head. Local congregations having elders who oversee that congregation, always a plurality of elders. You see it in Titus 1. Paul told Titus to go and ordain elders in every city on the island of Crete. The church of I had elders and deacons. Why a plurality? God's wisdom. One man's not to be a dictator in the church. On the flip side, men with unique skills and insights help an eldership make wise decisions. In reality, even if we lived in a culture where a church had to go underground, the beauty of it is that the elders could still have oversight, could shepherd, and could encourage the members. You think about every congregation as the church is designed being totally autonomous. The wisdom of God seen in that, there's no earthly headquarters, no universal, no national, no state headquarters over a congregation. A congregation like us at Washington Avenue is directly under the authority of Jesus Christ and no intermediary authorities between Jesus and us. Our loyalty is to Christ and him only. How does that show the wisdom of God? Stop and think about it. If two congregations were two miles apart and one congregation strays, it doesn't have to lead the other, lead the other one away from the Lord. If numerous congregations all over the world chose to leave Christ, every congregation is autonomous to the Lord and can say, we're not going to go anywhere. Our loyalty is to Jesus. And you understand the significance of God's wisdom in the fact that elders can only oversee that local congregation. How in the world can elders in Evansville shepherd Christians who are in Alaska? Probably most of us here who are elders don't even know any Christians in Alaska, let alone their struggles. You also see the concept of ministers or evangelists who preach the word. And the beauty of God's wisdom as he designed it, but that preachers are under the authority and the oversight of elders. They're not the pastors. The elders are the pastors, the shepherds and overseers. But at the same time, preachers have authority to preach the word authoritatively. Now here's the wisdom and the beauty of that. Thus, preachers don't have total control or authority over a congregation. 
God has a system of checks and balances in the church. If a preacher oversteps his authority and teaches error, the elders have the authority to correct him and to stop it. On the flip side, if elders overstep their authority or teach error, the preacher has the authority to reprove and rebuke those who leave the Lord, even elders. All oh, the wisdom of God designing the church. Another area where I see God's wisdom is in taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday. You know, there are all kinds of religions that have different practices about communion. Some churches take communion once a month, some twice a year, etc., etc., all kinds of ideas. But first century Christians took the Lord's Supper in worship every Sunday. You see this in Troas in Acts 27. You see this uh, in the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 16 and 1 Corinthians 11. Why did Christ establish the church where communion is taken every Sunday? It's a constant reminder for you and me as Christians of the Lord's sacrifice, of our connection to Jesus Christ, and that his blood enables us to be Christians. It's a memorial that keeps us humble. It is a privilege to read our spiritual batteries, so to speak. It's a time of reflection and examination of how we're doing spiritually. And we Christians can participate in this and every other command of worship, no matter where we are. Some of you in this room have been out on the battlefield in war, and you can still remember Christ on the first day of the week. Some of you have been on the other side of the world and have not been where you could worship with Christians like this in a congregation. No matter if we're at home or traveling or on the other side of the world, we can still remember Jesus, all the wisdom of God. Lastly, God's wisdom is seen in the home. You see God's wisdom in providing companionship for human beings. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper comparable to him. In chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined with his wife, and they'll become one flesh. You see God's wisdom in providing a place of security for children to be brought into the world. You see God's wisdom in providing guidance for children. They're not left alone to figure it out for themselves. But parents, fathers, are not to provoke children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You see God's wisdom as children can reciprocate the love of their parents and can desist and support aged and declining parents. The wisdom of God in the design of the home. Today, I just want to ask you to stop and as you go through the rest of this day, you go through this coming week, however long you live in this world, don't know how long that'll be, but I encourage us to never let arrogance cause us to miss or ignore God's wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 29, Paul talks about those who are arrogant. And Paul says, you know what? When you look at those who listen to the gospel call, there are not many wise according to the flesh. There are not many mighty. There are not many noble that are called. You know why? He says because people who think they've got it all figured out for themselves and they don't need God are people who say, I don't need the Bible. I believe in myself. You know the sad thing about that is they think they've got it figured out. They need to go read the book of Job. They need to le listen to Job chapters 38 through the end of the book and let God say, you think you got it all figured out? All right, let's have a trial. Just explain it all if you think you got the answers. But you know what? God's wisdom is all around us. And my encouragement to you today is to stop, to look, to observe, to consider, to contemplate, and then when you do all that, literally be amazed and be in awe and glorify God for all his wisdom and realize that in his wisdom, do you realize today in God's wisdom, you're alive 
And you have the privilege this morning, if your heart's not right, if you're not in a right relationship with God, you have a privilege today to choose to do something about it. Everything's ready spiritually. Jesus came and made salvation available. He gave us the commands of what to do in order to be saved by his blood. We don't have to go down the Ohio River and get flooded today, swept off by the waters of the river. If somebody's trying to be baptized, water's ready, it's warm, clothes are ready. If you're not a Christian, God is asking you, are you ready? If you're ready to repent of sins and confess your faith in Jesus, you can be baptized today to receive his blood and be saved. All the wisdom of God. And today as a Christian, if you need forgiveness, always wisdom, always care, always concern, he invites us to repent and come and pray. Would you, while we stand and sing?